So today we'll continue our series looking at some different ways to build a watch collection at a given amount of money. Next up, $12,000. If you're new to this series, this is something we've been doing for a while, looking at how to build these collections, different personas. We have done everything, I think, from $1,000 to $11,000, so it only makes sense to continue it moving to $12,000. A few ground rules before we begin. Retail prices only, looking at new watches only just because of the changing dynamics of secondary market trading values. I just wanna keep things on a straight line basis here so that in the future, people aren't getting mad at me if something does go up like crazy. Also, in addition to that, we are going to be looking at price ranges that have a little bit of fluidity to them. I mean, I'm gonna to try to keep it as close to $12,000 as possible. Some will be below of some of these collections. Also, some might be slightly above. So just give me some grace here. And then finally, for how we're going to build these collections, we have six different personas. Basically, these are going to be ways that someone can navigate. It's a philosophy or a type of collector to try to give some variety of how you can spend your money for this specified amount. And before we look at those personas, I wanna announce a really cool new watch that's gonna be coming available on teddybaldasar.com. This is the Mito TV Big Date. So as the name suggests, has a TV style case, but really leaning into a style of watch that is very popular now. It's not an integrated bracelet watch, but gives a lot of those themes. You can see some Patek Aquanaut and some of the vibes here, but this actually looks back to previous decades of Mido's archive, uh, looking at some of their watches and also is utilizing their big date feature. One of the few brands in the industry that are actually doing this. So what they have is two date wheels underneath that are gonna be working in tandem to indicate the correct date. This is typically associated with high high-end brands from Glassu to Germany, not from a brand that's gonna be pricing a watch around $1,000. So pretty cool to see in action, a variety of different dial colors to choose from, well-finished bracelet if you're familiar with Mido, no surprise there, rubber strap options to go along with it. If you're interested in these, links will be in the description down below to get notified when these become available. From here, let's look at our personas and then we'll dive into the collections. First, we have Persona 1, the one watch collection. This is the type of person that tries their best to find one watch that can meet all their needs and finds joy in the simplicity of reaching for the same watch every day. Persona 2 is ask me about my watch. So this collector is vying for your attention and doesn't mind making a statement with their watches, opting for models that can start a conversation. Persona 3 in this video is going to be the Explorers Club. This collector is all about adventure, always choosing the most appropriate watch for the environment they intend to explore, whether it's sea, air, or land. Persona 4 is the check off the boxes. This is the type of collector that needs to have a watch for every scenario, even if one of those scenarios never happens. Persona 5 is the perfect duo. This collector likes simplicity, but could never settle for just one watch. So they offer the balance of a dress piece and then a sports everyday watch. And for our final persona, we have the refined yet capable. This persona values tradition, dress watch looks and touches of class, but needs specifications that can handle the day to day. Our first persona is the one watch collection. And this was a little bit harder to find something right around $12,000. Not to say you can't get some great watches for $12,000, but to find something right on the nose of $12,000 retail is a little bit difficult. To kick us off though, we're going to look at the Rolex Explorer reference 124273. For those not familiar, this is the two-toned Explorer. And when this was initially unveiled, there was some polarization. There were people that were like, why are they doing this? There was an element of the Explorer being so pure, especially as it returned to 36 millimeters, that some people are just not gonna be on board for this. But I wanted to include this for a couple of reasons. One, this watch has kind of grown on me. I think it's also looks pretty nice with a two-tone. I'm not a big hater of two-tone. I know it's somewhat of a polarizing subject for some, but I believe it's coming back. I mean, some of the norms, what I'm seeing with uh, people and what their interests are, it seems like two-tone has some additional legs here in 2023. And the other reason why I like this watch from Rolex is, okay, you're getting the class Explorer form, but this is also one of the rare options where getting it at retail is not a pipe dream. These are watches that if you really are persistent and have a good relationship with your AD, you're going to get one of these. They don't appreciate like crazy on the secondary market, but uh, a watch that if you're just trying to wear one watch every single day, certainly will do the job. The Explorer in many ways is the epitome of that. Next, we have a watch that was recently unveiled this year at Watches and Wonders to, again, some polarizing types of thoughts. I mean, I think in terms of the design, it was absolutely on the money. But then for some of the positioning in terms of price, I think some people had some just ideas and maybe some counterpoints to that. And as the IWC Ingenieur. When I put this watch on, I almost didn't wanna like it as much as I did because I heard some of the conversation around it, but you just put it on wrist and this watch is simply phenomenal. They did such a great job with the dial texture, the case, the wearability, the bracelet, everything is so well done, 100 meters of water resistance, 
Still, some people have some conversation about the movement, but you can't dispute the fact that five-day power reserve on this movement still does the job. You also have a titanium version, but that's not gonna be viable for this price range that we're looking at today. Looking back to General Genta, SL Jumbo model, classic design. This was probably long overdue, but again, if you're thinking about a watch that could do it all for $12,000, this is gonna be as versatile as any. And then for those that want to get into some different sports oriented watches and can make this workable for them in a day-to-day -day environment. First, we have a dive watch, the Grand Seiko SLGA023. This is the new spring drive dive watch that they released this year. So the notable thing here, new blue dial, striking to look at, also utilizing their 9R A5 movement on the inside, tighter range of deviation for that spring drive. So this is not like your run-of-the-mill 9R65, even though that movement is spectacular. This is going even further with its accuracy. Case is going to be larger at 43.8 millimeters. I would say it wears slightly smaller, but with that lug to lug, still going to be a larger watch, 200 meters of water resistance, professional dive watch, loom is phenomenal. This Ushio dial is inspired by a flow of current and uh, really does a great job in creating this almost like ripple in the water type effect. And again, splitting in half the standard accuracy of the 9R65, which is already a very accurate movement. And then for our final watch here, we have the Omega Speedmaster Dark Side of the Moon. So ceramic case, Speedmaster, a little bit larger. I would say wears like a 42 on wrist though, as a result of more compact lug to lug, has more of that Speedmaster type effect. And if you've ever worn a Speedmaster from a professional to something like this, you recognize that they do wear much more compact on the wrist. With the ceramic working in its favor, that's even furthered in this instance. On the inside, you have the Omega 9300 caliber. This is a dual barrel movement, silicon balance spring, free sprung balance architecture, two barrels mounted in a series, and also coming with a column wheel, and the classic Speedmaster dark side of the moon looks. For our next persona, we're gonna move right along to ask me about my watch. So this is somebody that is not afraid of attention. They actually love attention and want you to ask them about the watch they're wearing. For our first watch, we have a independent brand known for their enamel work. This is Lundy Blue with their Spectrum Orange. So Lundy Blue is a brand based out of Neuchâtel, Switzerland. They have been around for some time and are known for, again, their enameling process. So enameling is very much an involved uh, art, really it's an art in terms of what is being delivered here. And one of the only brands really leaning into uh, this level of enamel at the price range that they're at. Most of their watches under $5,000 and I would say probably the most intricate of enameling. It's not the most affordable enamel being done, but in this price tier, uh, it's hard to really rival and say that there's anybody doing it better based on everything that I have been seeing from this brand. Enameling is a process of taking this powdered glass material on different plates uh, for dials and heating them up in ovens to a very high temperature. Usually the baseline is around 700 to 800 degrees Celsius and can get much hotter and you also have to time this out perfectly. Any issues with the timing and how this is done and applied could create some issues with the dials. So the failure rate for these dials are very high. On the inside, you have higher grade Sleda SW300s, nice wearing dimensions, very clean in their approaches and just a beautiful uh, approach uh, across the board. They probably have the largest array of enamel colors that you can go for. They also have these more ornate patterns and designs that they are doing. So not just even standard, uh, just one dimensional styles of color, very one dimensional with this brand, but this orange just pops. Uh, and I just wanted to give it some shout because if I saw this on somebody's wrist, I would probably ask a question too. For our next piece, we have the Rolex Oyster Perpetual Celebration. So this is a model, I don't wanna say that I'm like ready to get one or I'm, I'm gonna run to an AD and get it because that's not true at all. I don't think this is a watch that's for me, but I kind of like it. I don't hate it as much as I thought I was going to when I first saw it. Like it wasn't where my eyes were gravitating towards. I kind of wrote it off and put it together with a, the emoji dial day dates and just kind of put them all in one giant pile. But this is a little bit different. I, I think for where it sits in terms of price, it's yes, still a luxury watch. It's not cheap. And I'm sure there's going to be a list of people trying to get this watch, but it, it can make more sense to own something like this than I think those crazy day dates uh, that are even more extra than this, both in cost and then in approach in terms of their design. Here you have this colorful lacquer dial with the different bubbles, it's playful. If you see this on somebody's wrist, you're probably going to be saying, you know, what's going on there? And what I also like about this is 
Yes, it does look like a Rolex, but also at the same time, it almost doesn't look like a Rolex, if that makes any sense. If I saw this on somebody's wrist, I don't know, and this could change based on how social norms and how we're going to change and look at these watches in the coming years, but it's almost like a different style of Rolex buyer. It's somebody that doesn't take themselves too seriously, but maybe wants to bring some uh, fun attention to themselves. It's not, but it's not the attention of like, hey, look at me, look what I can afford. This watch doesn't maybe give off that same vibe as even some of the more run of the mill Rolex watches might. So I don't want to say this watch is understated, but it is maybe slightly different than the conventional feel that comes with wearing a Rolex. And then finally, we have the Rado Diastar Original. So the Rado Diastar is a watch that for those that are not familiar, might be looking at this and saying, all right, this is really weird. What is going on here? This was a model from 1962 that was unveiled and at the time was really the most scratch resistant watch of the period. It had a different hardness treatment to its case. It also was one of the early adopters of the Sapphire Crystal. And nowadays it still embodies this concept and idea with its case. So the case itself, so there's this shroud on it that is actually not stainless steel, that is made of a ceramic material that is produced by Rado. And what's really remarkable about that is the hardness of that ceramic. So you have this polished effect, but it's incredibly scratch resistant, creating this unique silhouette in the process. The hardness rating on that shroud is around 1,750 Vickers. Untreated stainless steel, more in that range of 150 to 200 Vickers. So substantially more scratch resistant. Then you have a sapphire crystal at the middle. This watch is also beloved in many different parts of the world. I was educated and told by a follower that basically if you are a young man in India and you have a big wedding, uh, chances are you might be gifted a Rado Diastar. Like this is like such a huge emblematic symbol of just coming of age and is an amazing gift for people and also seen as a true luxury watch and goes hand in hand with a Rolex in terms of being as in demand as any. Now, Persona 3, we have the Explorers Club. So this is somebody that is gonna break things down, land, sea, air, starting with the sea. We have the Oris Aquas Date Upcycle. So if you're not familiar with this watch, this is their familiar Aquas collection, which is their standard professional dive watch. But this model is going to be utilizing this unique dial that's actually made of recycled plastic. What I think is interesting about this is not any one of these dials is exactly the same. So you see one of these and you get one look, but if you look at maybe your friends who has a different one, they would have a totally different dial. It's almost like this free flowing splatter paint type of effect. And you don't know where the you know splatter or drops of paint are going to land. That's basically what this dial is giving you. Some people might not like that idea. They might like a carbon copy, exactly what to expect. But for others, that might be a cool draw. A 41 and a half millimeter case and also a 36 millimeter option. They have slightly different dial variations in terms of the colors that are going to be showcased there. If you're not familiar with the case size and wearing dimensions of the Aquas, because it has more of an integrated style bracelet, Bracelet, I would say each one wears about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half smaller than the proposed case size. So 41 and a half wears like a true 40. In the case of the 36, I would say wears like a 35 or so. So much smaller watch. 300 meters of water resistance, SW200 on the inside, reliable movement, as widely used as any movement on the entire market, and one that should give you a lot of confidence. For our next piece, we have the Zenith Pilot Automatic. So this is the new released from Zenith this year from their pilot collection that has been pretty much revamped. So Zenith, just to take a step back and introduce the concept of pilot watches for this brand, this was a brand that has actually a pretty impressive history when it comes to pilot watches. One thing that's notable is in actually the 1800s, late 1800s, they were able to uh, trademark or have some ownership over the word pilot on watch dials. So they were the first to do that. So having some pretty interesting foresight there. And then in 1909, the brand actually produced an early pilot's wristwatch for Louis Blériot crossing the English Channel. They also produced Italian military chronographs in the 1960s. And this is the approach to their modern pilot pilot design. You have both a stainless steel option, which will be the choice here given the price, but you also have a ceramic option to go along with it that will be a couple thousand dollars more. 40 millimeters, but I would say it wears slightly larger around 40 and a half to 41 millimeter with that maybe more elongated lug to lug, 100 meters of water resistance. And notably with this watch, it does feature an El Primero movement on the inside. You may recall the D5 Skyline from the previous year also showcased a El Primero movement on the inside. So basically taking that architecture of the 3600 and using it in a three hand format. But the contrast, simply beautiful. And I love the handling look of this dial. It's really striking if you catch it at the right angle. And for our land category, we have the Ball Engineer Marvelite. 
For those not familiar, I am from Cleveland, Ohio and still live here today. And Ball is a brand that was actually founded in Cleveland, Ohio at a place called Kipton. And if you've ever seen my video where I actually go to Kipton, Ohio, there's not much to see in Kipton nowadays. It's a very, very small town. We're talking about probably a hundred or so people that live in this small little town in the downtown area. But this was the location of a train crash. So it was a head on head collision where two conductors were coordinating on the tracks and one of them dropped their watch or their a pocket watch at the time and it threw off the time. And it unfortunately led to a collision head to head of these trains. And unfortunately, uh, many people lost their lives in that collision. And then Web C Ball came in, he owned a watchmaking shop in Cleveland, Ohio, and he put it on himself to really raise the standard of railroad chronometers in the region. Ball watches became a staple in the world of railroad chronometers, and they were being used all across the Midwest for exchanging goods and being used by conductors and were known for their accuracy. This takes a lot of that DNA and infuses it within a wristwatch. You're getting 100 meters of water resistance, a very wearable case at 40 millimeters with a 46.6 millimeter lug to lug, different dial colors on these now. And you're also going to get their use of tritium, which is uh, one of their unique characteristics. There's very few brands in the industry that are utilizing tritium. You have Luminox, uh, Marathon, probably the other notable brands doing it. But I think Ball is probably the most daring with how they incorporate it and with the different colors they sometimes will decide to use. So our next persona is the check off the boxes. So one watch for pretty much every different type of scenario. For the everyday casual category, I'm gonna look at the IWC Mark 20. This was unveiled at the end of last year. This was the successor to the Mark 18. So 19 was completely skipped, moved right along to the Mark 20. So a few changes here, and I would recommend checking out my full review of this watch if you're not familiar with the changes from the Mark 18. Uh, but one of the most notable things is going to be that lug to lug dimension, more compact. Uh, the water resistance is also going to get a bump to 100 meters and an automatic IWC 3 Three two one 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 with a five day power reserve on the inside. This was a well done release from IWC and well, honestly, long overdue because the Mark 18, I think many people like the style. IWC owns this Flieger-esque style of dial and being one of the big five in uh, World War II of delivering and uh, uh, producing these watches during the period. So to have a watch that really was going down the list of the checklist of what somebody might look for and be more of a no brainer, I think the Mark 20 gets people closer there than the Mark 18 uh, given the wearability and then some of these other features like the water resistance and improvements to the movement. So now we need a dress watch and I'm trying to balance out all the different prices. I'm going to look here at Nomos with their Ludwig model. This is the standard dress silhouette, one of their trios. So you have the Tangente, you have the Orion, and then you have the Ludwig. The Ludwig is going to be identified by its use of Roman numerals on the dial, probably the most classical. So it fuses those traditional Roman numerals with the more avant-garde and at times very minimalist design of Nomos. And it fuses together in a very nice way. So you have different case sizes to choose from, some different dial colors to choose from. On the inside, these watches is the manual Nomos Alpha Caliber. This was their first in-house caliber, basically reworks the Pazoo 7001 and takes all of the construction and assembly in-house. So they were able to produce this at a larger scale because they were basically getting bottlenecked by Eta at the time. And this set forth a new tradition for Nomos in producing their own in-house calibers, now uh, eclipsing well over 10 in-house calibers to their name. Now we shift into complication. And for a complication, I'm going to be looking at a GMT here at the Longines Spirit Zulu Time. Look at the 39 millimeter because that is the new face around town. So the Zulu Time was a watch that was unveiled in 2022. At the time of its release, I mean, I was definitely a huge fan, but at 42 millimeters, some thought it was maybe too large. Longines sometimes does have a tendency for their watches to wear larger than the case size might indicate given their longer lugs. They did make some changes to the lug architecture for these watches that made them much more wearable. But even to that point, I think some really wanted also an alternative or at least an option for a 39 millimeter or some smaller size that can complement that 42. And so far, these watches have been one of my favorite releases of 2023 without a doubt. 39 millimeter case, 13 and a half millimeter thickness, basically undercutting that of the Tudor Black Bay GMTs and the Black Bay Pros by a full millimeter. Also 100 meters of water resistance, COSC certified, really an in-house movement. This is a proprietary movement being assembled at Longines' facility. And then the history of this watch is remarkable. You're talking about a lineage of 
two time zone watches that started back in 1908. Think about that. Rolex started in 1905. Longines was producing a pocket watch in 1908 that had two different time zones. Then in 1925, you had the original Zulu time where Longines is often compared, at least the Zulu time is often compared is Tudor. Tudor was just trademarked as a name in 1926. A year before that, Longines already had a dual time zone watch. So the history is important when really appreciating Longines. I love this brand. I think this has become a watch and brand in general that I like to champion just because once you recognize Longines history, you're like, what? What am I, it's just like this jewel that was like in your face. When you have something in your face for so long, but you don't recognize it, it's almost like this wake up call I think a lot of people have when they delve a little bit deeper into what Longines was known for and what they still represent today. And then for the final watch in this category, we have more of our beater watch, and this is going to be the Tissot Sidreal. I actually have one on my wrist right now because we're in the middle of summer and it just feels appropriate. So this is a watch made of forged carbon and of any watch that this case material material is going to be really the most attainable I can think of. I can't think of another watch with this case material under a thousand dollars. For the blue option, it has little fuses of blue within the case, which makes it a little bit more of a crazier watch than it already is. Uh, another thing about this watch is it looks back to their archive, early 1970s, really where this collection took off with the Sidreal. But across the board, it delivers on specs. 300 meters of water resistance, 41 millimeter case, unique case material, very lightweight on the wrist. You are getting more of a conventional powermatic movement on the inside. It would have been nice to see something with either a COSE certification or the .811 with their silicon balance spring, but a really interesting watch in the different colorways. And one other thing I forgot to mention, the loom on this thing is nuts. If we turn off the lights here and just show a loom shot, it's probably one of the best I have ever seen. Now we have persona number five. This is the perfect duo one dress watch, one sports everyday piece. This is gonna be that perfect balance. Starting with the dress watch, I think this is becoming one of the best points of value in luxury dress watches, maybe the best, because what you're getting here for just over $6,000 is phenomenal. Uh, and also there's been a lot of changes in the dress category under $10,000. You see brands like a JLC, uh, just the standard tribute reverso is getting closer to $10,000 now. Not to say that that's not a great option, but something like this becomes even that much more enticing. This is the Glassucha Originals 60s edition. So this is classic 1960s design from Geo and uh, German design. Now, some people are going to mention like the Timex Marlin, just to break it to you, there are many brands that have a 1960s dress watch of this style. This is a very uh, emblematic design of the period that Geo can claim as their own style. 39 millimeter case, 9.4 millimeters in thickness, 45.5 millimeter lug to lug, pretty good wearing dimensions for a dress watch. But the movement is why this watch is compelling. You're getting an automatic 3952. This is a simply beautiful movement, skeletonized rotor with a double G symbol. 21 karat gold oscillating weight, swan neck fine regulating adjustment. This is one of the best movements you're going to find for around six to even like, if this was in a $10,000 watch, it still would be class leading. It's a wonderful looking movement. This is where you're seeing more industrial off the shelf movements. Not to say that this is a completely bespoke movement, so there's not any machine finishing happening here, but the level of finish, if you look at this compared to a lot of other the competition, uh, you'll notice that this is a substantial step up and this is a watch just over $6,000. And then to conclude our nice dichotomy here, we have the Tudor Black Bay Chrono. Probably right in the mix for one of the best chronographs in this price range, around $5,000. 41 millimeter case, 14.2 millimeter thickness, and a lug to lug of 49.8 millimeters pretty much wears to the extent of that 41 millimeters and pretty true to size, 200 meters of water resistance with screw down pushers, automatic MT5813 on the inside. So the cool thing here is this is a Breitling B01 base caliber that Tudor is going to utilize. This was the exchange of technologies. You saw you know, the Super Ocean Heritage from Breitling utilizing the uh, MT caliber from Tudor in, in exchange they received the Breitling B01 to use in some of their watches. So if you're talking about the vast market, what's available to you in the Breitling B01 is a phenomenal movement, uh, one of the best in automatic chronographs. And this is probably the most attainable way that you can get into one of these movements while getting a design that is going to look very much like a Daytona. It's going to lean into classic Tudor DNA and in totality a watch that many that are a fan of Tudor and maybe even not a fan of Tudor have really gotten behind. Now for our final category, we have Persona 6. This is the refined yet capable. So fusing 
understated, classy elements while still getting some sporty upside in the process. Describing that right loud, the first watch that almost springs to mind immediately is the Cartier Santos. Now the origins of the Cartier Santos come from sports pilot's watch. It's not really a dress watch, but as the collection has continued over the years, it has basically reinvented itself as a dress watch for many people, but it's never fully lost that sporty upside in design with the screws and just how it looks, Alberto Santos Dumont and you know being a pilot, all of that is factored into its story in totality. The Santos de Cartier uh, this year released at Watches and Wonders was one of my favorite releases of the entire year. You had the blue and green at that medium size and I love the medium size. It's a perfect him and hers watch. If you're somebody that wants to find an excuse to share a watch with your significant other and find something you both can enjoy. The on the fly adjustment system is very nice. Thickness, very wearable on the wrist, still very elegant. But the blue and the green, why I like these two is just because it it allows them to elevate a little bit further into that sports category. Still getting 100 meters of water resistance, automatic MC1847 caliber on the inside, lot to like. Wears very small, it is a smaller watch, no question about it. I would say it wears true to that 35 to 36 millimeter range, but as timeless as you're going to come by in the watch category. For our next watch, we have the Tudor Royal. This is the unsung hero within Tudor's collection and a watch that is neglected by many. I'm not going to say it's my favorite Tudor watch because it's not, but does it deserve maybe a little bit more love than it probably gets? Probably. I think just like you, you hear about the Black Bay all the time and you know, rightfully so, it's a phenomenal watch. But this is a model like the 1926 that is very much forgotten about. And for those that are just looking for a do-it-all watch and also at the entry door of Tudor, this is just over $2,000 you can get into one of these watches. It does present some interesting value. Also, this is Tudor's approach and really the whole Rolex organization's approach to an integrated style bracelet. Uh, option. So if you like that style, you like the Rolex design DNA, and I wouldn't say that this is very much a Rolex design DNA. I should probably just say like the Rolex group design DNA because that also encompasses Tudor. This is what you would have available to you uh, within the entire group. You are getting a sleet of movement on the inside, so hence why this is going to be at the more attainable end of their spectrum. Pretty wearable, different dial colors to choose from now, as well as case sizes. And then for our final watch on this list, we look at the Long Jean Conquest updated for 2023. If you can recall the previous Conquest collection, and I believe they're going to be phasing these out, uh, we've been getting word that these are no longer going to be available. So if you are in the market for those Conquests with the larger crown guards, uh, those are going to be moving, they're gonna be moving away from those and shifting into this design. And I can't say I'm upset about that because this looks a lot more refined. Uh, there was a totally different approach. Not to say the previous Conquests were a bad watch. I mean, I thought they were really good watches. They just had a more rugged feel to them. This is more to the theme that we're talking about here. Some elegance to that everyday style compared to the ruggedness of the previous, which in turn did have way more water resistance. But in this case, you have the finishing on the dial, the case finishing as well. The bracelet is way more just streamlined. It's thinner. To kick us off, we have a 41 millimeter case option and also a 34. 41 probably going to be the eyes of many people out there that are watching this. That would be the size for them. 10.9 millimeters in thickness, still getting 100 meters of water resistance. The L888 caliber, so getting that 70 hour power reserve on the inside. Pretty much for a watch under say $2,000 just that can do it all. I mean, this is a new addition to that collection. I always reference the 1926 as being that watch that could really do that and be one of those unspoken heroes around just being that everyday watch for 2000. This is right in the running now and arguably maybe taking a bit of the lead. I think this is a beautiful looking watch. I love the direction that Longines went with this. You are seeing a price increase as a result of some of these upgrades and changes with this uh, look on the front end of the watch, but uh, beautiful nonetheless. But all right guys, that concludes my video looking at six different personas, how to build a $12,000 watch collection. Of all these collections, which one would be the one that you would go for? Which one do you like the most? If you were gonna build a $12,000 collection and maybe you have built a $12,000 collection, how would you do it? What watches would you have or what watch would you have? Leave a comment down below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Really would appreciate that. It does help out the channel. So I'm not just saying that, would appreciate it. And finally, check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. How we're able to fund all of these productions is through selling watches on our site. I know nowadays, you have plenty of options in terms of where you can go to buy a watch, uh, but that really allows us to keep doing what we're doing and we love what we do. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.